Well, it just goes to show um, that uh, all the benefits that we suspect um, come from peer work uh, are in fact definitely realisable when we have uh, great workers um, like Jeanette um, devoting their time and energy and skills to supporting people and helping other carers to support people more effectively. Uh, I think that in some ways uh, the peer workers um, are like in IT projects you identify someone as the key user yes. for the system um, yes. and you go to them and say you know how's the system actually working for you? Peer workers fulfill that kind of role for the mental health system in some respects uh, but we really need to listen to our That's key right. users a lot more That's right. because really if it's not working for them it's not working. Yes. So um, I will now come to uh, the uh, presentation of Eileen MacDonald, who is also a very experienced um, peer worker and peer work trainer, um, who's a, a national representative for many years on the National Mental Health Care and Consumer Forum, as well as being on the board of Carers New South Wales in the past, I believe. Yep, uh, uh, and uh, you know, has a, a long and eminent um, history uh, in promoting rights of carers um, in New South Wales in reform processes and at the national level. So um, we're all very keen to hear um, what Eileen has to say and she's promised to be a bit controversial. So. <laughs> <laughs> How, how fortunate are we to have Jeanette here, and isn't that inspiring? Um, and I'm really grateful that you have to have to follow. And yeah, I did ask uh, Jonathan if it was all right to be a bit provocative, and he said go for it. <laughs> so, you know, blame him if you do. <laughs> um, look, I know that the people who are motivated enough to be here and the people who will be motivated enough to actually watch what's videoed from today, you, you already know a lot of the, the basics, so I'm not going to go through that, I'm not going to do death by PowerPoint, but I do want to turn this on, on its head a bit. Now, you might think I've come to the wrong forum because I'm going to say, did you realize this is a gender issue? Now, you're probably over it. There's been so much gender stuff in the media. A lot of people here have been really, really involved in different aspects of that. But I want to turn this on the head. I want you to think for a moment in terms of care, peer work, opportunities for care, peer work, not just in New South Wales, but across Australia. I live in a country area in New South Wales. And think of it as a gender issue. Have you done that? Have you thought of it as, as gender discrimination? Yeah. I'd like you to turn to, to one other person or two other people and talk about just that. For, and I'll give you one minute out of my precious <laughs> 10 minutes. Okay. Why is it a gender issue? We're going to reframe this as human rights. Okay. <laughs> Education and support groups, three quarters, you know, two thirds, three quarters, eighty percent are women, and then the, the carers who are men usually have employment, so there's something in that as well. Yeah. 
So the discrimination right. side employment That's opportunity. That's a point. Thank yeah. you. Back there. Yes, From I'm Larry. Yes. I admit I'm a male carer. <laughs> Trial aged parents, both male and female. But we've heard instances already today of females caring for females. And it was our suggestion in our little group that uh, there is an over preponderance that we've seen of females in this uh, sector, this work type. You can tell by the number of males in the room today. Mm -hmm. Do they just not come to functions such as this, or do they not wish to put their hand up? Good question. So, would you please remember to speak to the issue of males caring for females Absolutely. today, as well as females who would be in the predominant number caring for other males? So let's not forget the males. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. Yep. And also the males have always been the breadwinner years ago. Can you hear her? The males yeah. have always been the breadwinner bread years ago. So uh -huh. naturally they're more prone to sort of like go out and work the long hours. And it's the female that sort of like keeps the home together. So that's an issue. I know where I support. Um, we have a, say, 20 20 support, uh, 20 carers, and there may be one or two, and they're older men that have retired. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other points? Quick ones? Yeah. Well, I'll just say that I do think that it's not a coincidence that it's the thousands of hours of uh, work that women put in caring for people, uh, their adult um, relatives, that doesn't get recognised, mm -hmm. and that men in particular tend to demand to be paid for work or not do it. Okay, yeah. that is a, a yeah. listen to that. Okay, yeah. you can yeah, no, that was just something but that might not be accurate. I've noticed that there are a lot of female support worker for carers and a lot of male peer support for consumers. Yeah. But then that might be again because I've got a son and they allocate usually a peer worker, male peer worker for him, I'm not sure. But um, yes, I've, super, I've noticed that. I, I just also gather that we men are nurturing by nature and uh, and caring and have empathy so maybe that makes them more prone to um, to do that job too and uh, voluntary because yeah. we do it as a mother anyway okay. and um, but also the fact yes the fact that um, a lot of us might have or sacrifice our jobs to stay home and do it while so you're hearing the key bits yeah. that's mm. right it's sacrifice yeah. I think we mm. might tend to sacrifice um, by nature a little bit easier. Sorry, you pick up my pen all the time, thank you. <laughs> a little bit easier than other people. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a generality. I don't it, could, it could be perceived as easier, but it could be a cultural expectation that's, what that's quite think. historic or culturally based or um, uh, economically based, etc. But yes, those are all really valid points. One other quick one before I go on. Yeah? Uh, can I just see if there's someone else who hasn't had a say yet? Anyone who hasn't? Just one word that pops out to you from all of this. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah, Jeanette. Um, in my family, I have so many people that are proactive, pro um, gender. You know, if somebody's gay or something like that, they're very pro. And it's all older people. And I, you know, the older generation that, you know, that are a bit like that, not so much the younger generation I've seen. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so they're more open to to it. But saying that, I said to my, to my family member, why is it that somebody has to, you know, to be happy, did they have to, you know, come out or do all these things? You know, they have a right to be happy. You know, they have a right Thank to be. Thank you. So don't carers, don't carers deserve recovery. Yes. Don't right. carers need recovery. And when I say carers, I'm using the big picture word because probably 80% of the people in our population who are supporting a family or friend who are experiencing mental health issues would not identify with the word care. There's somebody's relative, there's somebody's friend, um, they might be their housemate, whatever it is, a tenant, but they're not identifying necessarily with that word. And so, but just like a lot of people with mental health issues do not identify with the word consumer, and in health, we're all consumers. Mm. And then there's the siloing 
that comes from clinicians, clinical services, health and bureaucratic services, and this is an anti-bureaucratic. If you're a bureaucrat, please know your love. <laughs> you have gifts and skills that I could not touch. But to make things convenient, to make things fit in categories, into databases, into trainings and everything else, things are siloed. So you're given a hat to wear. It might be the care one, or the care peer worker, or the consumer one, and the consumer care worker. So when those of us who put together the peer work training, which was put together by an equal group of national representatives who are very experienced care peer workers from around Australia, and consumer peer workers from around Australia. When they put that together, there is one module in the training that's for care, about care peer work. And it's all about caring for the consumer. Yeah. All right? So I said I'd be provocative today. I'm not being anti. I'm pointing out some home truths that you may already know. But I want to bring these to your awareness so that you're the ones who are proactive. All right? So that you're the ones who are empowered to think outside the square and not accept status quo and same old, same old. All right, and be willing to look at this as a human rights issue of why should carers always take second? Why should carers always, why should we have to wait until the consumer peer workers have plenty of work and then they might get around to the carers? When there is a robust national and international evidence based, and there's plenty of evidence of the value of the role of care peer workers. And to, I find it personally, and I hope you would rise up and feel the same indignity that I did, to know that one of our area health uh, services said, well, we might try someone in a voluntary role to see if it works before we decide if we offer some positions. Some of you will know where I'm talking about. <laughs> Whereas around Australia, particularly two other jurisdictions, they have a very robust care workforce, peer workforce, and from managers right across, and this isn't a hierarchy that you start as a peer worker and that's low down, and eventually you might become a manager or a this or a that. Actually, different roles take different skill sets. And the things that Jeanette has exhibited, patience, listening, um, thinking various levels and skills and, and really being able to tune into a person and, and make the connections out there, that's a very different skill than a manager skill or a care researcher skill or a care advocate skill, et cetera, et cetera. What her experience highlighted is the same experience that the consumers experience in peer work. I've been both because I've been a consumer all my life, and I only actually found out I was a carer <laughs> I don't know, somewhere in the last 20 years. <laughs> the word never occurred to me. I was a family member who was not coping, and gosh, I know if I had met someone else with the lived experience to be able to relate to me in my struggle, things would have gone better for me and the whole of family, and probably my friends who had put up with me, <laughs> etc. So the recovery outcomes of care peer support, there's a greater, and this is from research, I can give you all the references if you like, a greater likelihood of carers and their family being able to continue in their care role. It isn't just about what you're doing for the other. Uh, there's a lovely cartoon slide I've seen at Carers New South Wales of a care with a suitcase and it's saying who's going to care for the care. Yeah. yeah. Improved outcomes for the whole of family, which as a society in Australia, in terms of human rights, we accord that to our indigenous people, we accord that to our Calvin ethnic communities because we see that they function as family, as community, and if you have an appointment, the whole bang lot show up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's none of this primary care thinking at all. Shouldn't that be the way it is for all of our society? Yes. My goodness. Improved recovery outcomes, hopefully. And of course, there's, there's good evidence of this for the persons that are being cared for. 
and reduce the number of care and families who experience family breakdown, financial breakdown, their own physical and well-being breakdown. The longitudinal studies on carers show that they have the lowest well-being in Australia. And their lifespan is just as compromised as it is for indigenous population and those with severe chronic mental health issues. Is that making the media? No, it's not. Is that in the discourse that's being held at ministry level and decision-making levels where the funding is? No. So that's why I say to you, it's a gender issue because if the majority of carers were men, we wouldn't be having this forum today. Would you agree with that? Yes. yes. Historically, across history, women have, not because we're so much better at nurturing, there are some fantastic men who are great at nurturing, and in many cultures, it's actually the men that do it. But it's been the expected cultural norm that the man goes out and earns the living and the jobs are there for the men and the woman's there with the family. Mm -hmm. So whether you're somebody's daughter, daughter-in-law, sister, auntie, parent, uh, spouse, um, partner, flatmate, I've, sh I've shared house back when I was um, on my own with a mixed group. It, guess what, if somebody was sick, did the blokes go and look out? No, I mean, just went off and thought, yeah. oh, one of the ladies will take care of You know, they'll make them a meal, they'll share their food. It's common thinking. So that's why I'm saying it's a gender issue. It's a human rights issue. So the issues that Jonathan already highlighted for us today, of, as soon as I saw that announcement from the minister, I wrote to Jonathan and said, would you immediately find out if this is consumer only or are they doing um, I'm trying to think of the English, sorry, it's not my first language. <laughs> um, half and half, are they doing, you know, is this equity? Is this equal? You know, this course has been nationally funded so that consumers and carers can have employment. That's the bottom line. Economic opportunity and employment. Please use these terms. Please think of these terms. For the NGOs that are here, you're not for profit sector, when you put your tenders in, are you putting in tenders in for more care of your workers? Or are you just taking the, the pickings off the table if you're lucky? Are you embedding that in the practices of your organization and expecting it to be at an equitable level? So these are the kinds of things I want to encourage in your thinking. Not necessarily come up with the answers today. That's the work we all go away and do as we put in tenders, as we go out and provoke others to not just sit back and go, oh, well, when things get better for the consumers, they might consider uh, the cares. So uh, I know I'm preaching to the converted here a little bit, but what I wanted to do is bring your thinking around some of this language. I'll just remind you, a peer and peer work does not come from health or mental health. I was involved in this stuff back in the 70s. Where? In the education sector. That's where it really comes from, the education sector and in the corporate sector. That's where mentoring comes from. All this sort of stuff that now health and mental health are kind of going, oh, yes. And here in Australia, there are some robust, um, already done, very well presented national scoping and research. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel on that. But I found a great quote. Let me just give me a minute to find it. I talk too fast for you? No. <laughs> and you're really welcome to disagree with me, that's fine. Um, and I also want to commend to you to look at, and CARES New South Wales has this information, the Care of Life course. Have a look at that if you haven't already, because that research is a framework that shows that people have different needs across their life with ever, whatever they're experiencing, that's yes. true for all of us, it's so true. okay, no matter who you are, but particularly for carers. Yeah. And when we're in the workforce as care and care workers, we've got a double, double whammy. We really do. We've got to deal with our own well-being, 
we have to deal with the well-being of our own family and what comes in the workplace. And the same issues that affect all peer workers, which Jeanette absolutely highlighted, when your role is not clearly defined in the job description, and everyone thinks they can just second you for this, second you for that, even though it might be well out of your skill set or your time availability, the time you take to go sit on that committee means you're not with the people you're there for or the data entry that you're required to do, etc. So just like anyone in any job needs very clear job descriptions and career pathways, it's just as true for care of peer workers as it is for consumer care peer workers. So it's not like there's new things here. The earliest efforts at care-based interventions were articulated in the 14 Principles for the Relatives and Carers by Alexander in 1994. It urges carers to seek useful supports, information, and peer supports to assist them in the journey of caring. And there's, there's research right across the board for that. So I'd like to encourage you to think about what are you going to do when you come away from this session today? How are you going to reframe the whole care of thing in terms of human rights, in terms of gender equity, in terms of personhood? And really wanting to see our community and families, no matter what generation of a family, whether it's the young carers, whether it's um, siblings who have yeah. gone to the other side of the world to avoid having to care for somebody in the family, which happens, mm -hmm. yeah, whether it's um, spouses and partners in our older age when you have one of you might be caring for the other with health and the other caring for the other one with mental health or both and you're trying to navigate multiple systems. Let's, let's reframe this. Let's get some action and traction and not sit back and be passive. Thank you. There's actually a great article that's been written in New South Wales called The Relational Aspects of Recovery. And it shows, it, it says that um, if we go too far with the individual's recovery journey without respecting and recognizing the relationships that support them, yeah. then we're sort of making their ill health their own fault and yeah. their recovery entirely their own responsibility. Yeah. And that is unfair and completely unrealistic. So it's actually really important that we value carers and care peers and, and the relationships. And it needs to be support. captured in the data collection because many of you will know what's not counted, doesn't get funded. More than 60% of people with health and mental health problems live with somebody else. But if you would ask them, do you have care, probably 55% would say no, yeah. because they're living with their partner. Yeah. They're living with a parent, a child, a, a sibling, a cousin, you know? Uh, whereas if the question was asked, do you have people in your life who are supportive? I think you get 100% uptake on that. So the data is quite skewed on that kind of thing. And many of the systems that we're all uh, affected by are not collecting um, the relevant and asking the questions in the right way. Yeah, yeah. The information that actually helps us achieve the yeah, results. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. Look, um, I would just like to pause to say that um, the agenda that we printed is actually, we had actually updated this what we were going to do was we were going to allow a short toilet break about now halfway through and then we were also going to um, uh, extend the final presentation because it takes a little bit longer um, so if oh, I know that there's some people here in a work capacity um, if it's all right for us to extend this to about 12 that was our actual plan that's fantastic all right in which case I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to let a couple go through to Eileen and then we'll have to sit down for a break um, but uh, what do you think the key role in the model of care for care peer workers could be? Because we actually get asked that in spite of all the excellent resources on the care uh, on the peer hub website that the mental health commission well, put together. Coming from my culture, you answer a question with a question. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'll say is 
uh, why should it be any different for a care peer worker than a consumer peer worker? What what should be different there? Right. So it's why the, is that question being asked? Yes. Yes. I see. Fair that enough. would be my question. Why is that question even being asked? Okay. Does that make sense? And, and then I go and say that they didn't know what to do with consumer peer workers either. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. there is some very good research that answers those things. There's some very good research that specifically says, how do you achieve this? What's needed to embed? And, and what comes through all the research is that if you don't work on staff attitudes concurrently with putting in positions, uh, you've got a mismatch there, whether it's public or, or community. Um, do you know what I mean by yes. that? Yeah. Yeah. Where you have staff who might feel threatened in their role yes. because they don't understand the difference that, hopefully you know from what Jeanette said, the difference that lived experience brings to a role, whereas we have many people who are in roles helping carers who have lived experience but because it's not required criteria or desirable criteria for the position they have the freedom to use it or not use it and in some roles actually the ethics of their clinical role or their other role would mean they actually shouldn't or are not allowed to mm -hmm. all right that's a choice that person's made by taking that job and some of them do amazing work. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most of the organizations that have the funding in New South Wales for care or work positions, whatever they're called, do not require lived experience. Yeah. Not even as desirable criteria in the job. Does that seem a little strange? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Has anybody done anything about it? other than me making a lot of noise. <laughs> so I would like yeah, the few of us that make some noise, but it's not making a difference at the tender level, at the job description level. I brought with me today, and if anybody would like them, and I can point you to where you can get them online. Position descriptions, uh, charts of everywhere in Australia what the positions are and what they require. Awesome. All this has been researched, and then internationally. That's already done. It's already mapped. Wow. It's a sad picture for carers. Mm -hmm. Any other Thank questions? Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, we just sorry. Um, up. Can we go back to the gender issues? Um, I wonder also if the fact that um, we don't have many male carers is because of the fact that um, they tend, I hear a lot that they tend to be in denial about the whole mental health issues. And is it because they tend to be less um, equipped, and I'm not being sexist, but less <laughs> equipped emotionally to deal with this kind of hardship? when a woman tends to be pretty strong and yes and so I wonder whether the fact that it's actually I think it's due to the lack of education and they probably don't want to ask for help as well because then again it might describe some you know kind of weakness and so um, I thought if they get some education for men given by a male peer worker that could you know open their mind to to actually be more involved understand and understand that things maybe aren't as bad mm. as they thought or just at least face the the challenge and to deal with it and help working as a family yes, yes. As a community in the community there are so many issues and you brought up some really valid ones thank you yes. i suggest we have the conversations during the break yeah mm -hmm. yes okay very much thank you so much for your thank you very much for that So look, I think...